Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. We never spoke about what happened, at least not to each other. Fear, I suppose. That to remember his name and what he did would mean letting him into our dreams. And me, I hardly dream about him anymore. Still, things won't ever be the same the way they were before he came. But that's all right, because if you hang on to the past, you die a little every day. And for myself, I know I'd rather live. Welcome back. You are listening to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, Cape Fear. Beware, spoilers. Coming to you from my basement, as always, my name is Don. And to my right, we have the professor, Ken. Hello. And to my left, we have our comic book guy, John. This is my night counselor. Don't you step on my lines. All right. So uh, how you guys doing? Uh, doing pretty good. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tonight we are going to talk about Cape Fear, which was released on November 15th, 1991. Directed by Martin Scorsese. Screenplay by Wesley Strick. It's a remake of the movie Cape Fear from 1962. And it's based on the book The Executioners by John D. McDonald. It stars Robert De Niro. Nick Nolte, Jessica Lange, Jodon Baker, Robert Mitchum, Gregory Peck, and a young Juliette Lewis. Cape Fear, this was a pick out of uh, the Bronco Helmet, and this is our second film in the Martin Scorsese threesome that we have going on. Uh, we had The Wolf of Wall Street, now we have Cape Fear, so that means that this came out of our director's piles. Whose movie was this? It was mine. Yours. So we are yet to see John. Yours was Wolf, right? True that. Yeah. So we are slowly whittling down that list of directors in their movies. But yeah, comic book guy, have you ever seen this? I have seen it. I think only once before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, professor? Once when it uh, came out on VHS. Yeah. That, that's where I was at. Well, one interesting thing I didn't realize is uh, Robert Mitchum and Gregory Peck. What were they in together? What weren't they in together is the question. Well, related to this movie. Well, they were in the same movie from 1962. They were in the 1962 version. They brought them back for this movie. That's yeah. kind of cool. After watching it last night, I was thinking, maybe I do want to watch the original. Uh, do you know which character played which? Yes, I do. As do I. Oh, okay. There you go. I, I, it's been on the loader to watch the original, and it especially came up after watching this. So Martin Scorsese, he is a very talented director. And in general, where does this movie lie in his pantheon of directing? This is earlier in his career, but not that early, because he's already won. Uh, wait, no, he hasn't. Not At this time, he had not won an Academy Award. Nope. And... His Academy Award nominations, we counted them up. Don, what did we come up with? He's been nominated for the Academy Award for Best Directing nine times. Nine times? Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ, Goodfellas, Gangs of New York, The Aviator, The Departed, for which he won, Hugo, The Wolf of Wall Street, and most recently, The Irishman. That is just a really impressive list. A really impressive list. There's some strong movies in there. Oh, Absolutely. Um, one of them happens to be one of my all time favorites. So, and what movie is not on that list? Taxi driver and the King of comedy. And what about Cape fear? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if Cape fear would necessarily come, uh, fall into the best director, best picture category. Cause it does not fall into that category. Which is funny that you say that because he just comes off Goodfellas being nominated for the Academy Award. So you're kind of expecting big things Absolutely. from this, right? Absolutely, because it is such a strong movie. Goodfellas is put together so brilliantly. And his next movie is this, which it just feels so different. And maybe he does this on purpose because, I mean, it is a remake. Uh, the story has already been told. It's uh, mm -hmm. He's got to tell it in a new way uh, to uh, bring it up to, I guess, at then modern times. 
So what does he do? He starts with his ace in the hole, Mr. Robert De Niro, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you bring Robert De Niro attached. Was not was he nominated for this? Robert De Niro was indeed nominated. There were there was uh, two nominations for this movie for an Academy Award. One was Robert De Niro, and the second one? Best Adapted Screenplay? Best Supporting Actress. Best Supporting Actress. Juliette Lewis? Yes. Nice. And, and so I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I was surprised at the stark differences between this movie and his previous movie, Goodfellas. Uh, night and Day. Do you know how he came into directing this movie? I do not. John? I have heard, but why don't you enlighten us? Steven Spielberg was uh, potentially going to direct this movie, but then he thought that he wanted Scorsese to do it because it would give him a stronger name. And so Spielberg kind of sort of laid it in his lap saying, you need to direct this. Yeah. And he chose to do it. What about the, uh, the writer, Wesley Strick? Do you know what else he did? What did he do? He did another movie that we have reviewed. It is a movie that is one of the lowest rated reviews that we have done. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. All right. So Cape Fear, first impressions, gentlemen. First impressions from when I saw it in the early 90s or first impressions from me watching it last night? Uh, tonight. I didn't mind it. I thought uh, it was interesting. I saw a lot of visual techniques that Scorsese was using, and I saw a lot of techniques that I'd seen in previous films from Scorsese and actually Spielberg. And I got to say, there's fundamentally, it's not a bad movie, but there are problems with it. And I think that uh, by no means is it a perfect film, but I thought it was all right, I guess. Mm -hmm. John? Well, you guys have educated me on, you know, not just looking at the plot of the movie or the story of the movie, but to actually look at the way it's directed. And now that we've started watching some Martin Scorsese movies, and now that I know some of the other movies I've watched of him, I've started to look for camera shots and camera angles. And you can see Martin Scorsese's stamp on this movie in the way the camera is used to set the mood, to set, you know, a feeling of unease. Um, so at first... I enjoyed that part, those parts of it, and I found Robert De Niro's portrayal creepy as hell, which when you get a feeling, a vibe from a movie, that tells me this is going to be a good movie. You? I uh, did not have a strong feeling of the, that it was a good movie when I saw it initially. When I look back, it's like, I don't remember liking it all that much. And then watching it last night, I got to say, it really drugged for me, and it's just like, oh my gosh, how much more time? Yeah, well, I will go ahead and just say this right now. I was watching my clock uh, toward the middle and uh, more into the third act. Uh, And I have to say, I do remember not, I'm not a huge fan of Nick Nolte. Um, I didn't. Fair. I I didn't, uh, I didn't, I don't remember his performance being memorable and going back and watching it again last night. Yeah, kind of the same thing for me. And, you know, there's other issues uh, about, about the film that we'll get into once we start talking about it. You bring up a good point about your feeling about Nick Nolte, and I I have to agree with you 100%. I'm not a huge fan of him, especially in this type of role. What about the other actors and actresses? Did you, what did you feel about Robert De Niro's portrayal? Uh, Robert De Niro is, I mean, he's the stamp and anything he touches. I think even like the, when he goes into comedy, I think he nails it. So Robert De Niro is fantastic. Nick Nolte, what I, uh, you know, I already kind of said that I'm not a huge fan. Uh, Jessica Lange typically I think is a phenomenal actress and she does really well in this, but what throws me off is her fucking haircut. Every time she comes on screen, uh, Juliet Lewis, I thought, uh, I thought she did a great job and I think this is her first gig and uh, she's so young, and she plays the naive, innocent little girl perfectly. Uh, Joe Don Baker as the PI, he's always fun in movies, and especially in the 80s and, and growing up. I've, he's been in uh, a lot of stuff. And then you have your cameos with uh, Gregory Peck and Robert Mitchum, which, I, like you said earlier, I think is a nice touch. So I think the cast did really well. you know. And again, they're working with material that's already been told. So... What do you think, Professor? Do you think the casting was good? Yeah, in general, the casting worked for me. I felt that Max Cady is a wonderfully creepy character. He he, he is uh, so so intimidating, intimidating on screen. His character just uh, oozes 
uh, discomfort and uneasiness. And uh, the uh, the Sam Bowden character, he just came across as kind of sort of not quite weaselly, but I suppose he's a nice guy, and it looks like it, it's a nice family. But we can get into that more. In general, I just thought that Sam was a lesser character, and uh, I, I think, I think um, Jessica Lange is a fine actress. Nothing stands out about her necessarily in this role. I also thought that uh, Juliette Lewis, uh, she definitely shines in a few of these scenes, and in particular, the cast overall works for me. It's funny that you say that thing about Jessica Lange because you know what the first movie that pops into my head when I think of Jessica Lange is Mm -mm. Tootsie. Oh sure, I think she's great in Tootsie, but I mean maybe she's playing a uh, a version of herself. Maybe Uh I don't know. I always think of King Kong with her. Oh yeah, for sure with Jeff Bridges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now when I when I saw this movie, you know, just the other night, you know, not really having recollections of when it came out, I kept thinking. Why does she have the Sharon Stone haircut from Basic Instinct? But then I realized Basic Instinct came out after this movie, so yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's that fucking haircut. <laughs> yeah, just, it made me think. I'm like, at first, I'm thought, is that Sharon Stone? Yeah. No, that's Jessica Lange. So, how did this movie do? Uh, it was made for 35 million and turns around and makes 182 million dollars at the box office. That's impressive. That is impressive. And I think Scorsese's name brings a lot of that draw. And on top of that, add Robert De Niro, and they just came off of Goodfellas. A lot of that profit was just on that basis alone. Probably. You know what I mean? One thing that I appreciate about Scorsese films um, is the ad-libbing, is the things that he just lets the actors make their own scenes. And I guess there was a lot of that in this movie. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I guess like that scene between De Niro and Juliette Lewis, that was all impromptu. They just were told to go ahead and like she didn't even know he was going to stick his thumb in her mouth. They yeah, did well, that. She looks like it. <laughs> they did that scene in three takes and ended up using the first take. Yeah. So I guess there was just a lot of that throughout this whole movie. Well, he is famous for letting people ad lib and going uh, impromptu. Right. Yeah. So and then the other improv. the other thing is with, when you add in someone like De Niro who really gets into his roles, really takes him seriously. Did you hear about uh, what De Niro did with the dentist? No, what do you do? He paid a dentist something like uh, $5,000 to fuck up his teeth for this role, and then after the movie was finished, had to pay $20,000 to have his teeth fixed. Well, he did get nominated. Max Cady is definitely one of the creepiest characters on film. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and Robert, uh, Robert, De Niro's version, at least. Uh, I don't know how Robert Mitchum played him because I haven't seen the original, but... Yeah, uh, he is reminiscent of uh, uh, No Country for Old Men, Javier Bardem's bad guy. One more thing I want to mention, because, Professor, you mentioned it earlier that Steven Spielberg was originally set to direct this movie before he passed the baton on to Martin Scorsese. Do you Do you recall who he wanted to play Max in the original or in his version of the movie, Steven Spielberg? No. No, no clue. Bill Murray. Interesting. That was who he thought he envisioned to play that role. Can you see Bill Murray in that kind of role? If uh, Spielberg was going to make it a comedy, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if Murray has the chops to pull that off. Murray was, but Murray was starting to move in that direction. He wanted to get into dramatic roles. 91? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. It would have been a completely different movie. That's for fucking sure. Sam Bowden is a lawyer living in North Carolina with his wife, Lee, and their teenage daughter, Danielle. Max Cady, a former client of his, is released from prison after 14 years. Cady was tried for statutory rape and battery of a 16-year-old girl. And appalled by the attack, Sam buried evidence of the victim's promiscuity and Katie's unawareness of her actual age, which might have lightened Katie's sentence or even secured his acquittal. Bowden believes that Katie, who was illiterate at the time of his conviction, remains unaware of his purposeful botched defense. Unbeknownst to him, however, his former client is a naturally intelligent and single-minded psychopath. He learned how to read and studied law in prison and even unsuccessfully appealed his own conviction several times. He tracks Sam down and begins to terrorize the Bowden family. 
He lurks near the property and the family dog is mysteriously killed. Sam attempts to have Katie arrested, but the police have no evidence of a crime. After intentionally crossing paths with her in a bar, Katie rapes and beats county courthouse clerk Lori nearly to death, who is in love with Sam. Despite Sam's advice, she refuses to press charges out of fear of their ongoing platonic flirtation becomes public, as well as unwillingly to be cross-examined and humiliated by her own colleagues. Sam hires a private investigator, Kersek, to follow Katie. Now, before we get into this movie, regarding the opening of the movie... Sal Bass. See, I remembered. I listened to you, comic book guy. You mentioned how much you loved it in Catch Me If You Can. So when I saw Sal and whoever, it might have been his wife, uh, name as the opening credits, I thought of you because I fucking listened to you. And what other movie did Saul Bass do the opening for? I don't know. I don't listen to you. <laughs> Catch Me If You Can. No. <laughs> did you already say that? Yes, dude. I didn't realize you had said the name of the movie. Because you don't fucking listen to me. <laughs> so yeah we have the opening credits we have sal bass um are you an alfred hitchcock fan at all oh my god this thing reeked of alfred hitchcock i was just about to ask you i got a huge vibe an alfred hitchcock vibe oh yeah uh, it was alfred hitchcock and martin scorsese it felt you know what i mean felt very much like vertigo uh i was thinking vertigo psycho psycho um there was a, there was another part in but we'll i'm sure it'll all rear remember. window a little bit yeah, probably, you know. Um, so, yeah, and then we uh, we focus in on a pair of eyes, and it turns out to be Juliet Lewis, and she's going to be our narrator for this film. And, you know, she starts us off. And then we jump to Max in his cell. In the score, the soundtrack that keeps coming over and over, his theme, I guess it would be. I swear I've heard it in a billion other movies, but it might be that the billion other movies took it from this movie. I don't know. I, I didn't look it up, but we see uh, Robert De Niro in his cell and he's all tatted out and he's just looking like a fucking bad ass. And again, he Robert, looks, he looks ripped. Yeah. And Robert De Niro's in his fucking prime probably. And yeah, such a badass, so intimidating, so creepy. And he gets out of prison. And I, I love the line where he says, uh, Katie, what about your books? And he says, read them already. And just keeps walking. An interesting thing about, you know, we talk about Martin Scorsese and his camera shots and angles, things like that. I liked how in this scene, you know, they start off really, you know, zoomed in on him and then they start pulling out and that's when they, you start seeing the bars of the jail cell and it kind of frames him. So he's the main focus and you pull out a little bit farther, you know, professor, you always talk about these camera shots um, and you really get to see that this is, you know, a jail cell. It was pretty obvious in the beginning, but you get to see that jail cell and you get a really good impression of who he is. Now, there's a big foreshadow in this scene when they when he's basically leaving his jail cell and you bring up the books. There is a book on the shelf. Did you see this particular book on the shelf? Uh, I glanced because I figured maybe there might be some sort of thing there, but nothing jumped out at me. I didn't care. Okay, there's a book on the shelf called The Cell Within. Do you know what uh, particular information about that book? you know the relation of that book? No. That book does not exist. Yeah. It is not actually a published book. It has appeared one other time. In the 1962 version? No, it appeared in an episode of Miami Vice. Oh, interesting. It was uh, basically a scene, a book that was in a prison cell of someone who had gone to jail. I believe it was Tubbs or someone had sent him to jail. And so when he got out, he sought revenge on Tubbs. So they put that book in this. That, that's the, the clue that this was going to be what Max Cady's uh, mission was going to be interesting seeing the books on the shelf it's like i wonder if those mean anything to us don't care yeah, yeah. now earlier i talked about how the bars kind of framed uh max a bit did you notice a lot of other scenes he seemed to be framed or like there were things framed around him like when he was on the wall initially he had branches around him it always seemed like a lot of his scenes he had something that kind of framed him in the picture no what i was focused on when he was on screen was him I didn't necessarily catch that very often, but uh, it is definitely a conscientious choice that uh, Scorsese does. Yeah, I was wondering if that was something that, you know, I, I've seen a few of his movies. I haven't seen a lot of his movies, so I was wondering if that's something like maybe that's a Scorsese thing to frame his villain or frame his focus. He did a lot of zoom ins and zoom outs during dramatic scenes as well. He's, uh, he's very deliberate in every single shot. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, and we've said it before. Uh, he's got his style. 
Right. Mm-hmm. So this is where we meet uh, Nick Nolte, Jessica Lang, and uh, Juliet Lewis, the Bowden family. And I, I think this is kind of where my first uh, nitpick of the movie comes from. Uh, first of all, I don't buy that Nick Nolte's with uh, Jessica Lang, and I certainly don't buy that Juliet Lewis is a product of Nick Nolte and Jessica Lang. So right there, the family dynamic throws me off. Um, it's I'm weird like that. Uh, I'll do that to fucking commercials, or I'll do it all the time. But yeah, it just it I, I didn't buy it. It didn't click. Yeah, and and I w- and I was wondering, is it because I'm not a huge fan of Nick Nolte? You know, but as the movie went on. Um, I wouldn't say he grew on me, but he wasn't as horrible as I remembered him being. So either way, yeah, I, I just didn't buy the family dynamic. Mm-hmm. You didn't feel that they were connected, that there was a family uh, relationship there? Yeah, maybe. Um, Yeah. So we meet Nick Nolte's character and we find out that he's the lawyer and that, you know, we kind of go through their daily routine and Jessica Lang is an advertising marketing. It looks like she's a graphic like designer, does logos. Yeah, something like that. You know, and Juliet Lewis is your typical 15 year old little girl. Um, what do you think of the fast cuts they were doing? They're kind of jumping scene to scene real quick. Uh, I started thinking about that as soon as they started doing it, because I do notice those things and I'm thinking, Oh, he's putting you on edge early. Mm -hmm. He's going to do this throughout the entire film. So just get used to it. Right. And so after a while I I didn't notice. Yeah. Cause I, at first I didn't like it, but then I realized that exact thing he's trying to set, set you at unease. Yeah. Well, he does it for for me. He does it right away when we are introduced to Max with that theme and him doing the pushups and I am already uneasy at this point. So after we're introduced to the Bowden family, I'm just waiting for the next thing to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Cause you look at all that body tat, work on him it's like this is trouble with a capital t this screams screams we are in for some deep deep shit in our introduction to this family they you know we see them going to the movies and uh we see max is going to the movies do you guys notice what movie it was i don't remember i did but i don't remember what it was john ritter's in it Yes, it's Problem Child. Problem Child, yeah. Yes. So uh, they go see Problem Child, and uh, Max is sitting a couple seats in front of the Bowdens, and he's smoking a cigar in the theater and laughing, laughing hysterically. Uproariously. Yeah, it's so uncomfortable. And I'm I'm trying to put myself into Nick Nolte's spot. You know, what would I do if that was happening? And I'd probably do the same thing he did. Let's move. (laughs) So then, yes, we have Max confronting Sam out in the parking lot after he leaves uh, Racquetball. And what did you think of that intro? Of them meeting for the first time? Of Max getting to know Sam, introducing himself back into Sam's life. Um, I, I thought that, for some reason, I thought it was going to go real south real fast uh, for whatever reason. Maybe the way De Niro plays it. But as the conversation goes on, it's almost like he diffuses it and Nick Nolte decides to talk to him like a human being, right? He had maybe the first thing that doesn't pop into Nick Nolte's head is that this guy's out for revenge, right? But maybe he's there for a handout and that's kind of how he takes it. Um, I thought it was good. It was a good uh, intro to the two characters together. I thought it was, uh, I didn't think it was going to be that subtle. And so just kind of sort of easing into who Max is going to be is done very, very gently. Yeah. Yeah. And we find out that, uh, you know, he did his time and he wants to be in New Essex. That's the town community they live in. And uh, Nick Nolte even says, hey, man, are you following me? It was just a small town. You know, we're bound to uh, run into each other. So, yeah, so the creep factor starts. Yeah, I thought Bowden would take it a lot more poorly than he did. I thought he would either make threats at him or do something and already start falling into that situation of where Max wanted him to go. So Max must be doing his research because he's waiting for Sam when he's done with racquetball uh, with his lady friend. And, you know, he uses that. Eventually he uses that against her, What against him. Were they having an affair? No. Uh, no. I think that she wanted to, and maybe he even wanted to, but he just wouldn't cross that line. So right. they they were heavily flirting, 
But nothing was really happening. Yeah, you could tell because after the racquetball game or during the break or whatever, he gives up behind her and he's trying to teach her how to, you know, uh, throw the racket or swing the racket. That was a little bit more than instruction, you know, so. I figured if there was something real going on between the two of them, uh, we would have been shown it. The uh, the the shot, it's now at, back at home and the and, uh, husband and wife are together and we get this crazy close-up shot of Sam brushing his teeth and it bugged me this crazy close-up and it was a forced perspective shot as well. And there's a lot of these kind of shots throughout the movie. And it just really took me out of the movie having these crazy close-ups that they kept sprinkling throughout the movie. That that's kind of what reminded me of Hitchcock. Exactly. Hitchcock does the same thing or did the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know what scene, but drove me nuts was after uh you know Sam and uh, Lee got down uh she sits in front of her vanity and starts putting on makeup. I thought that was a fucking dream. That was weird. You know what I mean? It was just a weird place to it was a weird action for her to do at that time. But then we find out that Max is sitting on his fucking wall fence outside and uh she Lee opens up the blinds, looks and then immediately goes to the next window. And opens up the blinds as to hopefully see something different. I didn't get that. Yeah. Some of the actions in this film, I was uh, like, why are they doing that? And all the times that uh, uh, Sam would come in and close all the blinds, bam, 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 bam. I mean, he does it like six times in this fucking movie. You know, who keeps fucking opening them? Anyways, I digress. So Sam goes outside, tries to find him, can't find him anywhere. We find out more about Max and it come to realize that the reason why Max appears to be after Sam is because Sam has buried information that would have been crucial to have during Max's trial. Yeah, he's talking, uh, Sam is talking to his boss or his colleague or his partner at work, and he tells him, you know, I fucked up, I buried this, I buried this evidence, and even his colleague was like, dude, you fucked up, right? And um, so he was, he was, hoping that Katie didn't know that and being the reason for him to come after him. Um, Now, this is actually one of the biggest differences between the book and the original movie. In the original book, in the book and the original movie, he was an attorney. Bowden was an attorney, but wasn't representing Max. He actually witnessed him attack a youth and he testified against him. And put him away. And help put him away. And that's why he was going after the revenge. Now, my question to both of you, as a defense attorney, bearing this type of information, you think he should have been disbarred? I don't know if he would have been disbarred, but yeah, I would say he should be reported. 14 years later? Either way, I mean, just the fact that he committed a crime. Uh, Yeah, sure. So in a way, and I know there's a lot of Bible talk in this movie. Um, There's a lot of, you know, vengeance and all that. Is he basically, karma-wise, paying the price of his crime, of his sin? Yeah. Well, you could definitely see it like that, but then you also have to look at it from the other side of that coin. Uh, we know what kind of character Max Cady is. Mm-hmm. Uh, we It's shown to us, right? Whatever the motivations are, whatever it takes to get him there, we see him at his worst. One could say that Sam did society a favor for 14 years, right? So, I mean, it comes down to, yes, uh, burying the evidence is illegal, and he did it, and he broke the law, but I think he did it for the greater good. The greater greater good. good. Because in the end, what Sam is doing is, well, for all intents and purposes, justice. I suppose, yeah. And that's, but he feels like it is. And he made a decision and he has to live with it. And now the mm-hmm. consequences are coming back. Yep. Could it be karma? Sure. He, uh, what goes around comes around? Sure. He even says, I think, to his colleague at that point, that's why he gave up being a defense lawyer. Yeah, I think so too. He became, I guess he went and worked for the prosecution after that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that has got to be a, a difficult wire to walk to have the best defense available for somebody that you know deserves to have punishment brought down upon them. And in the end, you have to trust that justice will prevail and the law will get it right. That's how I I wonder 
how a lot of defense attorneys, you know, work with clients that they know are guilty. I mean, I've heard a lot of them say that they just automatically in their heads assume everybody's innocent until proven guilty. But what happens when they know they're guilty? Yeah, well, it's an age old question, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm not a lawyer. Mm -mm. Yeah. I don't think I, I think I would have buried the evidence as well. Would you have? Probably a 16 year old girl. Probably. So what about the dog? Were you, were you content to just have the dog not be there as opposed to actually seeing what happened? I am a firm believer of less is more. And, Me too. Uh, Me too. I mean, depending on the story, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that we don't need to see the dog's death. I think that, you know, the reactions and just the fact that, you know, the dog we, was We poisoned. don't know. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know what the fuck happened. We assume it was Katie, and that's what uh, Scorsese wants us to assume. And it probably fucking was. I don't know if he ever confesses to it or not, but it probably fucking was. Um, but I didn't need to see it. I'm glad we didn't see it. But, you know, you knew it was coming. So. so Sam goes and he confronts Max and they talk to each other. What did you think of the conversation? I think that De Niro carries every one of these scenes. And I noticed that I, I have to watch the movies with captions on uh, because, well, I'm deaf. But... uh I noticed that a lot of Nick Nolte's lines were just repeating the same lines. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know. Or, or mm -hmm. uh, the dialogue kind of fell flat for Nolte in these instances only because De Niro is so strong, you know? So I found myself uh, more watching De Niro carry Nolte than, you know. I was just about to say he outacted him in every scene. Yeah. Yeah, because Nick Nolte, he's, he's pretty flat in this. Yeah. Yeah, he is. You know, he's he's showing uh, emotional range, yes, but for whatever reason, I don't know what it is necessarily, but I, I have little sympathy for him. And, and he doesn't make a good compelling case necessarily about why I should be on his side, even though I should be on his side because he is our protagonist. The only reason I am on Nick Nolte's side at this point is because of the wife and daughter. Um, I think that you have to protect your family and your family will come first. And so that's the only reason why I'm rooting for, uh, Nick Nolte. If Nick Nolte has no family in this story, I'm kind of rooting for De Niro, you know? So I think the wife and kid, uh, make everything different. I guess Martin Scorsese originally turned down this movie and didn't want to direct this movie for a long time because he thought that the Bowden family was too happy a family. So I guess that's the reason why we got a lot of the family internal drama and turmoil because he didn't want them to be this happy family all the time. Yeah, well, I'm glad he did because it, it made it a little bit more interesting for me, I guess. But um, them being happy, happy all the time, I, with Nick Nolte, I still don't know if I would have bought it. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I honestly, I agree with you. I don't think he pulled off his character. Yeah. He wasn't believable. So he goes, and this is where we get our first cameo uh, from the original film. This is Robert Mitchum playing the police detective, and they bring in Katie, strip him down, and uh, I like what uh, Mitchum starts saying to Sam. Well, did you see him do it? Well, no. Well, do you have anything? Do you have any evidence? And he's like, no. And he's all, you're a fucking lawyer. You better, you know better than this. What the fuck are you doing, right? That's why that scene, I think, bothered me. is because he should have known better. A hundred percent, right? But Totally. But either way, uh, Katie comes in. And uh, I always love in police shows or, or police movies when they're looking at the one-way mirror and the people on the side that are uh, not looking at the mirror side, uh, the police people always say, oh, don't worry, they can't see us. Well, yeah, no shit, but they still know it's a one-way mirror, and you can see, you could feel the look that De Niro was giving Nolte uh, while he was getting shaken down. So, yeah, and and, he, the, and he knew who was on the other side of that mirror. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he uh, he is playing Sam Bowden like a fiddle. Yes, he's just reeling him in, and all those sexy close-up shots of of uh, Max Katie's body and all his tats yeah i noticed that too that uh, he and the camera holds on it just long enough for you to read it maybe process it and then it cuts to the next one the next one the next one uh just out of curiosity since neither of you have tattoos uh which one of your which one of max katie's tattoos was your favorite the big cross with the scales 
Yeah. And it really summed up, I guess, if you look at the different Bible verses, they were all about truth versus vengeance. And that scale really sold that. Yeah. It's a truth and justice. Truth yeah. and justice, yeah. Fresher, any thoughts? The uh, lightning bolts. Oh, right. The yeah. six that he has on his abs? Yeah. Yeah. That, those are cool. I at first thought that those were a symbol of white power. I just thought of them as lightning bolts. Okay. But that's just me. Uh, the cops are like, dude, uh, come back to us if you got something, blah, blah, blah. We have the uh, street parade of unhappiness, if you will. You know, it's this supposed to be this happy parade, but it's mournful, s- sad music. And we see that Max is across the street from Sam's family. The only bit of acting I bought from Nick Nolte in this whole uh, movie is that scene that you're talking about. When here, happy, happy, and he looks up and he sees uh, Max. Rob, uh, Max, you can see him go white. You know, he, he looks very concerned. And so he goes and he attacks Max. In front of witnesses. Yes. Is what I kept thinking when we see that scene. He's doing all this and he's, he's falling right into the trap because yes. he's doing it in front of everybody. Yeah, he's completely baiting him. Mm-hmm. He's a master of it. Being played like a fiddle. And you can tell that, you know, probably for, well, however long he knew, you know, not hold the whole 14 years, but he's been planning this exactly how he's going to twist that knife. Uh, he probably started planning it when he found out that Sam buried the evidence. That's what I'm thinking. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and he had years to work it out. Yeah. And so now comes his next step and he meets uh, Lori at the bar. Uh, Max does. And, you know, as, as soon as this happens, I'm thinking, uh-oh, this is not going to end well for her. Mm-hmm. You know, he, uh, they have their little chatty moment. Uh, then he takes her back to his place, her place, whatever. And we see the savagery. Oh, my God. I thought for sure she was dead. That's what I thought, too. I thought he was going to when kill he, her, kill her, kill her. When he bit her face, I thought it was over. I thought he was going to torture her and just leave her body for somewhere for Bowden to find. Yeah. Um, we talk about those oh shit moments in these movies, and as soon as he comes up from the face and um, they, you see the wound, I thought, oh, shit, they showed it. You know, and they hold on to it for a second or two, but, I mean, great but makeup work. This scene kind of called back to something they had said earlier when Bowden was describing... Uh, his previous victims and how he had brutalized them. And I'm thinking this is probably how he treated those other victims. He brutalized them like this, maybe even bit them. That was De Niro's idea to bite on the face because he had been studying uh, pedophiles and rapists and things like that and read that the worst did things like that, you know, biting and tearing and cutting. And so that was his idea to add into this scene. Now the actresses, I can't remember what her name is, but it was her idea to keep laughing when she was handcuffed. Uh, She was, you know, originally she was supposed to start screaming at that point, but she wanted to give the portrayal of that. She thought it was still all fun and games at that point. Yeah. It's not until he whips her head back that that expression really changes. And I'm, I'm, curious did he i mean did he really go for it and do it because she looks like she's in fucking pain when he does that and when she starts crying so it's a very uncomfortable scene for sure so uh the police let know that uh max katie or we think that max katie may have struck again and sam doesn't know that it's Lori at first right and so they go into the hospital and then when he sees her and then she sees him you know he's like oh shit We we get that overhead camera shot and he realizes this has happened because of him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then they talk for a minute. He's trying to get her to press charges. Why? I, I, I guess I get why she doesn't do it, but why wouldn't you do it? Well, her excuse, and I kind of get it, is that she would have to go stand before all the people that she works with yeah, no, and I, tell them what happened. Sure. And she just couldn't face that at the time. And they say that, that uh, you know, Katie knew she wouldn't testify in that regard. So maybe he had just, you know, psychoanalyzed her enough that he knew. So now we have Sam go and we meet Kersick. We meet Kersick, Joe Don Baker. And this is going to amp things up a little bit more as he brings in a private detective. And the private detective, I liked this character. I thought he did a good job. Oh, yeah, so did I. Uh, you know, he says he's going to follow... Katie and I like when he goes to the restaurant and the uh, gal brings him his breakfast and he goes, well, I didn't order this. He goes, well, the dude behind you did, you know, that that's twice that Katie's done that. 
Katie approaches Danielle by impersonating her new drama teacher and feigning an unorthodox interest in her teenage angst. He lures her to the school theater, shares a joint with her, manipulates her libido and attraction to him, and kisses her. Her parents find the joint in her school bag, and Danielle's coyness about the extent of Katie's seduction drives Sam to the point of desperation. He then agrees to Kersick's plan, which he had dismissed earlier, to have Katie beaten up. He also gives Katie a final warning, which Katie secretly tapes with a hidden recorder. Kersick's three hired thugs accost and beat Katie, and Sam watches from afar. But Katie turns the tide on his attackers and viciously beats them instead. Katie then uses the recording of Sam's threat and exaggerated display of his own injuries to file a restraining order against Sam. Lee Heller also petitions the ABA Ethics Committee for Sam's disbarment, thereby triggering a two-day emergency meeting in Raleigh. Kersick anticipates Katie's intentions to enter the Bowden house while Sam is in Raleigh. The family fakes Sam's departure and hides in the house hoping that Katie will break in so that he can be shot in self-defense. Katie kills the Bowden's housekeeper, Graciela, and dons her clothing before murdering Kersick by garroting him with a piano wire and shooting him with his own pistol. Horrified after discovering the bodies, Sam, Lee, and Danielle flee to their houseboat docked upstate along the Cape Fear River. This brings up another big difference between the book and the movie. Uh, in the book, they set the trap on the houseboat to try to draw him in. In the movie, they use the house. And I got to say, this is kind of where it felt long for me. You know, they, they build up this house bit, and then we are transitioned to the houseboat bit, and I'm thinking, eh, it's feeling a little bit long. Now, the seduction in the auditorium, what did you think of this scene? Because we had talked about earlier this being ad-libbed. Uh, it was very hard to watch for me. Um, I have a 15 year old daughter and, you know, De Niro and Lewis, they fucking go for it and it's creepy as fuck. And yeah, his, his intentions toward that little girl are not nice. I think if I had like a daughter and we were watching that scene, I would just have to point and go, no, bad touch. Okay. But the whole reason why she's willing to kind of sort of indulge in, in this at the moment is because mom and dad are clearly having a hard time. She doesn't know what to think because mom and dad are fighting so hard. Yeah, she she does seem like she might be acting out a bit. She also maybe you know fifteen hormones are kind of raging. You know, she uh, Juliet Dreyfus Lewis uh, Juliet Lewis Dreyfus not based, Dreyfus. What was her last? Juliet Lewis. Oh, Juliet Lewis. Uh, even said that it was this scene that she actually started to develop a crush on Robert De Niro. Oh, interesting. We also have Kersick confront Max, and he tells him in no uncertain terms, leave. Right, right. And Max is just kind of plays him off. Mm -hmm. But he knows, Max knows something's coming. Yep, right? yep. What would you think of the fight scene between the three thugs and Max? Uh, I thought that it wasn't going to end well for the three thugs, um, I don't know why after Max gets the upper hand and starts beating the shit out of these guys, uh, I don't know why he just doesn't walk to the trash can. Especially he's, after he hears the noise. He's right there. I love the look on Nick Nolte's face, though, when he kicks the can. I was just, I was just waiting for something for like that to happen. And he does it, and he's like, oh, shit. Well, my first thought of, you know, you bring up a good point of why didn't he walk all the way. I feel like if he had... The movie, you know, the whole tension, all that would have ended sooner, and Max wasn't ready for that. He wanted to keep playing with Bowden. He knew Bowden was behind that trash can. He calls him out. So I feel like he wanted him to stew. He wanted to keep it going on longer. He wanted to torture him longer. So he wasn't ready to discover him there. Eh, maybe. I wanted to talk about another scene that took place before all of this. When Max confronts Lay and he gives her the dog collar. Yeah. And, and, and she is, she knows who he is. She can just tell. Right. And I just thought that that was a, 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 another time that Max is fucking with the family because it, it's, you know, he's getting at Sam every which way he can, you know, because here he is, you know, the dog. And then now he's torturing Lee, you know, with the dog collar and confronting her. 
he's unabashed. He's unafraid of any consequences, right? Yeah. And then after that scene with the dog collar or during that scene, Juliet Lewis runs out and, you know, Lee tells her to go back inside and that's where Robert De Niro gets a look at her and then he takes off. Yeah. And then we get, and then uh, she gets that phone call from him saying that she, he's the drama teacher. And then we go to that scene. Yeah. I guess that scene was a added scene that was not in the book or the movie. Uh, I believe I read somewhere that it was Jessica Lang's idea to add that scene in because she thought that it needed to be some interaction between her and Max. And then, and then another part that's also important that compels her to uh, do this is dad tells her, don't get any ideas about this guy. It was this moment of defiance against her dad and she slams her retainer back into her mouth. It was like, it, it was this little moment of defiance. And so she is definitely against her dad and she's pissed at both parents now right you know something that bothered me and i keep going back and forth on it there was plenty of times that Bowden could have told his daughter what kind of person max was what his crimes were and he purposely did not tell her that he was a rapist and a pedophile just that he was a bad man and I keep thinking, one, if he had told her maybe some of that, maybe you know he wouldn't have gotten as close to her as he did. But at the same time, was he trying to protect her and not have her hear that part of it? As you know, what what do you guys think? You know, would well, you have told your daughters that information? Well, I don't know. I think he did it to protect her. That's what I think too. Should so. he have told her the truth about him? Well, if she's fifteen, sixteen years old, maybe you don't. Or maybe you do. I mean, who knows in that situation? I think in today's day and age, you definitely tell her. Yeah. Um, in 91, I don't know. The, I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah. 30 years ago. My yeah. original thought is when it got to the point where you know this guy is stalking you, you know this guy could approach your daughter, he's already approached your wife, I think you just want to flat out tell her this is who this guy is. You need to report if you see him and if, if he's anywhere near you, you need to run the opposite direction. Well, yeah, you say that now. I mean, yeah. in today's world, for sure. Like, in, like if Elise came down and this was happening, I would, f I would for sure tell her everything because mm -hmm. I want her to be as safe as possible. Um, back then, I think that he was trying to keep it. I, it's twofold. He was trying to protect her, yes, but he was also really trying to protect himself. I, yeah, he was. I think he was containing it, trying, yeah. trying to keep it contained. Yeah, for sure. So, and so Sam threatens Max again. Yeah, again, this is kind of where we're feeling a little long uh, film-wise, but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And and with that, then we have the beating scene that we were speaking about a little bit earlier. Yep, and then the, the result of the beating scene is uh, <laughs> Max going to get a restraining order against uh, Sam. And who's his lawyer? Gregory Peck. Who played the lawyer in the original. So... Yeah, uh, you could totally see him getting set up, Sam getting set up, and now Max has him exactly where he wants him. Max looks like the victim, uh, completely bait and switch, and uh, Sam's fucking losing it. His world is being turned upside down, inside out. And yeah. he's on the verge of getting disbarred, and his uh, world's falling apart, and yeah, what's fucking the, going crazy. What is the first thing that Max had said to Bowden? You're going to feel loss. Basically, yeah, that he was going to take everything away from him. Yeah, he. Oh, and, uh, you, <laughs> I had to rewind that scene because I, I couldn't catch. I even had the captions on, but he says it so quick and it, they flash so quick, I couldn't uh, hear what he said. But it's uh, you're going to know loss or something like yeah. you're going to feel my loss or something you're gonna, like that. You're you're going to know loss. I think is yeah. kind of what he says, which is basically again. He's taking everything away from him, and he's doing a great job. This right here, he's about to lose his career, his family's in jeopardy, his daughter's against him. You know, it's working. The plan is working. Yeah. Yes, his family life is unraveling rather quickly. And so, so he goes to Kursik. I need a gun. Yeah, and Kursik's like, you don't want a gun. You mean Because as soon as you pull the trigger, everything changes, right? But then they come up with the plan. The teddy bear plan. Right. So, uh... I forgot this had even happened. Uh, well, let's be honest. I forgot <laughs> most of this movie even happened. Uh, so they set up a plan where uh, Sam has to go to Raleigh, North Carolina, and they know or they feel that Max will be watching him because he'll make an attempt on the two girls uh, when he's gone. 
So Max naturally follows him to the airport. They see him get out, but Sam doesn't go anywhere. And they kind of wait for Max to come in and make his move because Kursik gives uh, Sam the idea is we need him to break into your house so we can shoot him so it'll be self-defense and he'll be dead and we'll be done with it, right? Well, doesn't go down quite that easily. My first question, and I'm really curious about this, they talked about, you know, Kursik had set up the house so that he would know if Max tried to get in the house. But yet Max still got in the house. And then they even make the line of, this is how he killed the dog. He got into the house. They never said how he got into the house. Doesn't matter. That's what makes it more creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that somehow he the just had a, had a way in without anybody knowing. Yeah, it's totally the unknown. Now, in the scene where he kills Kursik, he's wearing the maid's outfit because he had just killed her as well. Mm-hmm. Whose idea was that? Robert De Niro's. No. No. Juliet Lewis's. No. Professor, would you like to? Nick Nolte. Us? No. Jessica Lang. Nobody in the movie. Nobody anything to do with the movie. It's who gave the movie to Scorsese. That was Spielberg's idea. That was Spielberg's idea. Yeah, he said De Niro should be wearing the outfit. Oh, that's good. Well, fucking it's Steven Spielberg. Why are you surprised? Now, one thing I did notice, and I watched this scene a couple times. When the camera flashes towards the, the maid when we see her back, then flashes back right before Kursik is killed, that was the actress. I it thought so, De Niro too. As well. It so was. They, they kind of threw a little wrench at her, or threw a little monkey wrench at us that, to make us think that that was De Niro the whole time, but no, that was her. And then uh, we, uh, Sam notices early on that one of the piano wires is missing, too, so I thought, oh, this is going to come back. Yeah, that was a great foreshadow as well. Yeah. And then down goes Kursik. Like a lump of bricks. And wasn't it fun having Sam slipping on Kursik's blood? Oh, my God. I'm thinking, what the fuck are you doing, dude? No fucking shit. That, that scene seemed a little unnecessary to it me. It was ridiculous. They, and the wife, he pulls his wife down under the blood, too. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was like a, a vaudeville comic relief moment, but yeah. it wasn't funny. And, I mean, could you imagine sleeping around in some guy's blood? I mean... That's just fucking, it was unnecessary, for sure, for sure. So what does the lawyer and his family decide to do? The most logical thing and most legal thing, they leave the fucking crime scene. Well, one thing I wanted to bring up before we jump ahead to that point, there's a scene where Bowden kind of chases after uh, Max a bit and shoots wide, you know, shoots the gun wildly out his front door. Do you remember that scene? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In the book... He actually hits Max. And when the police arrive and start searching the property, they find Max dead because he got shot in an artery. So that's how the book actually ends. So that's a big difference is that uh, those wild shots and would have ended the movie. Katie, who has followed the family, attacks Sam and prepares to rape Lee and Danielle while making Sam watch. Danielle sprays Katie with lighter fluid as he lights a cigar, engulfing him in flames and causing him to jump off the boat. However, Katie clings to a rope and pulls himself back aboard. As the boat is rocked by a violent thunderstorm, a badly burned and deranged Katie confronts Sam, putting him on mock trial for his deliberate negligence 14 years ago. Despite Sam's insistence that Cody bragged about beating two prior rape charges and that his crimes were too heinous for the promiscuity report to be taken into account, Katie berates him for failing to do his duty as a lawyer. The storm eventually knocks Katie off his feet, allowing Sam to gain the upper hand once the women jump off the boat and make it to shore. Sam uses Katie's handcuffs to shackle Katie to the boat. When the boat hits a rock and is destroyed, the fight continues on shore, but a raging tide carries Katie away and he drowns speaking in tongues and singing the hymn, O Jordan, Stormy Banks, I Stand. Sam washes the blood from his hands before he rejoins Lee and Danielle, who realize that things will never be the same for them again. Roll credits. So probably one of the most uh, uh, fantastical things is this undercarriage ride that Max does as he follows them out to the coast. I thought, uh, yeah, how the fuck does he do this? Well, I think when it comes to the scene, that's one of those scenes, you know, in Say Anything, we talked about the boombox over the head. In this movie, whenever I think of Cape Fear, I think about him hiding underneath the car. Really? 
Yeah. Totally forgot it was even in there. Yeah. And and for me, my first thought was, how the fuck did he... They must have been driving for at least two hours, four hours, however long. How did he stay under that the whole time? And then we see him remove the belt. Which I thought was pretty smart on his behalf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm wondering, how the hell does nobody not see that? <laughs> Let alone <laughs> the too. late... When he crawls out from underneath the car and that lady sees him and says nothing. Well, fuck, would you say something? I might say, um, um, did you know there's a guy under no, your No, you wouldn't. You'd fucking crawl right back into the store she came out of. If Robert De Niro got out looking like he looked, you would have fucking ran. Uh, so no, would you. He, so would I. He went to the bathroom. I think during the bathroom, I would have run after the family. Yeah, yeah, I'd like yeah, to yeah. think I would. My first thought is, I'm calling the police right now. Get somebody over here right fucking now. Yeah, that dude's fucking nuts. Now, I guess, crazy. did you hear about setting up for that role about Robert De Niro doing that stunt? He wouldn't do it unless he watched somebody else do it first. So they got a stunt man. Who, yeah. Could you fucking blame him? No. Yeah. Right. So, are you sure this is gonna work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll work. <laughs> are Are you sure? Thunk, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it probably didn't work too well. Um. Yeah. So this leads us to our third act, and you know, after what we just went through in the house and the murder, this, that, and the other. I, I was feeling a bit long here, and I, I was thinking, okay, yes. now I'm ready for this movie to be over. What do you think of when you know Nick Nolte's character went out onto the outside of the boat, and you get to the scene of the the wife and the daughter inside the boat, and you see you know the hand come down, grab him by the neck, and the next you see is just feet going up outside the window. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a good scene. Uh, I they had to they had to lure Nick Nolte out somehow, right? Um. And it was just Katie making his presence known. What kind of drove me nuts is that they kept cutting to that, uh, because Katie cuts the anchor. So they keep cutting back and forth to the, the rope. And like we said it earlier, a lot of the zooms, what started to get annoying for me, and no disrespect, Mr. Scorsese, I think you're a fucking master. Um, every time they would you know, show the rope, they would zoom in on it real close, hold there, and then cut to something else. And they do it on the characters' faces, and it was just totally. It was just that quick uh, zoom in, hold, and then you know for tension and drama. But I mean, I over got, overkill. A yeah, because I, I was tired of it by this point. Yeah, the whole houseboat scene. Uh, do you think that that scene? Because you mentioned how the song, the whole movie was going long. Do you think that that whole part of the movie was too long? Like we could have gotten rid of some of the earlier stuff and made that scene longer or just right? Uh, the houseboat scene? Just the, all the stuff with the houseboat. Uh, I think that it felt forced and that we needed an ending. If I was going to trim this movie, I would have trimmed it in the beginning and the middle and kept the houseboat scene because it's really not that long of a scene. Mm-hmm. It's long enough to make you uncomfortable. It's long enough for, at least for me, to look at my watch. Uh, but I think it would be more effective if we got rid of some stuff earlier on. It would have shortened it, which I think Phil might might have made it a better movie for me, but I don't know. I just I, I was ready for the the, uh, the movie to be done, and maybe you just get rid of the whole houseboat scene and you just keep it back at the house. Yeah, have some like the way you know it ends in the book. Maybe maybe end it that way. One thing that I had to appreciate in this movie was when um, Danielle is locked down below, and she's drastic, you know, dr- dramatically going through everything, mm-hmm. trying to find something to use. And she picks up the lighter fluid and I kept thinking, well, that's a great thing, but how is she going to light him on fire? How is she going to do it? It didn't click for me, the cigar. Neither. Yeah, yeah me and either. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. And I thought she was going to like have to hold a match and then click the match and do, you know, yeah, because she like kept the lighting, flame through thing. Yeah. She kept lighting matches down there. I'm thinking, okay, so she's going to have to light a match and throw the match on him. Yeah. But I mean, good for her for looking for a fucking weapon because she knew what was coming too, whether she wanted to admit it or not. And yeah, so we the he he gets him trapped in there. He ties up uh, Sam. Mm-hmm. And he's gonna make him watch, and then I don't want to say predictably, but uh, you know, Mother Nature interferes, and now the boat is unstable. Uh, did you notice that it's a miniature when it crashes? Yeah, it, I because I it kind of looks that. it looks like a miniature, but it's a well done miniature. How about that? I guess most of this was actually filmed in a 90-foot water tank on a soundstage. Oh, I believe that. And then all of the crash scenes and the breaking up scenes, you're absolutely right, was done with miniatures. Yeah, yeah. So Max thinks he's won, 
and he's going to have his way and he wants to light his cigar because he wants to celebrate. And uh, as we said earlier, Juliette Lewis has lighter fluid hidden and so smart of her. And what a great scene here where he lights the thing. She immediately squirts him. He blows up on fire and he jumps off the uh, jumps off the boat. Uh, do you recall, or maybe even the last time you watched it, did you think Max was dead or did you know he would be coming back? I had two thoughts and I even had two thoughts this time, um, which is either they were going to end the movie there with him jumping off the boat and leave it for possibly a sequel down the road that he could come back or he was definitely coming back right away. Yeah. You, I, thought that since he has gotten himself onto the boat that he has already ridden on the undercarriage of the car out to the coast he's totally coming back in just a minute (laughs) a little face full of fire isn't going to deter him now the scene of the mock trial after he you know gets back on the boat after being burned i feel like this was the most powerful of de niro's acting throughout the whole movie what do you think of that scene uh it was solid you know, um, at this point, I think I'm a little bit checked out, so it might have, might have gone. Uh, it might have been wasted on me to mm-hmm. say, um, but you know, he wanted his pound of flesh, and he was going to take it. Uh, and then you know, the uh, storm uh, breaks up the boat, and it's going out of control, and so the women imagined. Uh, but also, because of uh, this mock trial, Sam comes clean. And he has to admit it in front of his family that he did a a, a bad thing. And he didn't want to do that before. He wasn't willing to do that before. Yeah, well, he kind of has no choice at this point. Totally. What do you got to lose? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, really, looking at it now, they probably won't even think of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, who knows? Well, I think at the same time, even though he's admitting that he's responsible for sending this guy to jail for 14 years. After everything that they've gone through, they're probably thinking he should have died. He should have gotten the electric chair. They would, you know, the fact that the, the father kept him away for 14 years at least was not enough. Yeah, maybe. And then miraculously, the girls get off the boat. Yeah. And uh, very conveniently, the uh, handcuffs that Max was going to use uh, one end becomes free and Sam hooks it onto his ankle. And then I remember last night when I was watching it, when that happened, I went, Oh, I totally remember how this ends now. And yeah. Now in the scene where the boat breaks up and he starts sinking into the water and he drowns, I just have the sinking feeling that if they ever really wanted to make a sequel, that he probably just popped up about 50 yards down the river or hit a rock or something and got enough to get some air. He's still out there somewhere. They didn't see him die. We, we are told he is drowned, but we, we don't have a body at the end. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you just, well, for me, at that point, I was thinking, oh, fuck, thank God it's over. So I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Now, I was, uh, I read somewhere that the way that that scene was filmed, and he starts speaking in tongues and then starts singing the hymn, uh, that in the script was basically to signify that he figured he had already ruined the family enough, and he was on his way to heaven. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But he's burning in hell. I would like to think. Well, there you go. I thought he got a taste of it when he got the lighter fluid in his face. Now, do you want to know the difference between this and the 1962 movie ending? Not as much, because I am curious to see the movie, but I guess I'll play along. I I never said I wanted to hear it. I don't care. Go ahead. (laughs) Start talking. (laughs) What? I can't hear you, John. You can unmute me. Okay, go ahead. That's what I fucking thought. (laughs) Okay, anyway. uh, The way the movie actually ends, I guess, from what I've read in the 1962 version, which still makes me want to actually go see the movie um, or rent it, whatever. uh, They make it to shore. Both Nick Nolte and um, Robert De Niro's character, they both make it to shore. And... They have a fight scene, and Bowden gets the best of him and holds that big rock over his head. Now, basically, from the start, you know, Max wants to ruin and corrupt uh, 
Bowden the whole movie. He wants to take everything away from him. And the last thing he wants to take away from him is pretty much, you know, his self of de- decency. The fact that he hasn't physically killed anyone. So he wants Bowden to kill him. And Bowden realizes that and basically decides he's not going to give that to him. He lets the police arrive. They take Max away and he's given a life sentence. So he, he's forced to live in prison. That is a very 1962 ending. Mm-hmm. And, and the, they pay homage to it because Nick Nolte is going to crush him with a, and he fucking does it too. But the tide takes Katie out totally. And then we have him. Uh, I, I thought Nolte's character being hunched over, just sitting there. I thought that was nice. That was good. That he he's a broken man. Yeah. At the same time, I, I wonder if the symbolism of the blood on his hands and washing it away is washing away his sins, washing this whole thing away. I don't think you can wash this whole thing away. You don't think so? I well, mean, there seemed like there was some symbolism to that. Uh, potentially, but, you know, as, as it's pointed out by Danielle, you know, the, the end dialogue that she gives us, that the family's never the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oh, why does she say the end? Because that's the way it was written. I got this feeling. Fucking stupid. That, you know, she was our narrator, but I got the feeling that maybe she went on to write a book about it and she was reading us the end of her book. Yeah, you read way too much into these things. Mm. Uh, so what do you guys think? Do you think we should rate this bitch? Let's rate this bitch. Hey there, Professor. Uh, how do we rate our movies? We rate our movies on a scale of one to five fucks. Five fucks is a movie that is cinematic gold. This movie is something where you're ready to watch it again anytime. One fuck is a movie where you've seen it and you have no desire to ever see it again. And what's a zero? Zero fucks is a movie that you say to yourself, I have to have two hours of my life back. Somebody owes me. Who made me watch this? Fuck you. There you go. I put this movie into the Bronco Helmet as a Martin Scorsese film, so I think it is only fair that John goes first. That works for me. Through doing this podcast, I'm actually growing a more appreciation for Martin Scorsese as a director. Uh, I'm, I'm finding myself paying more attention. I said this earlier to his camera shots, to the style of the way he does things. I like the fact that, you know, I now know he has the actors ad lib parts and do it as they want to do it. So I'm appreciating that. This movie as a whole was a tough ride. It was a tough movie to get through. There were a lot of slow parts. Uh, great acting on the part of Robert De Niro. Um, I really appreciated him in the movie. But overall, the cutscenes were a little bit too much for me. The zoom scenes, it did give me that feeling of unease, which I, I'm getting, you know, what Scorsese was going for, but it wasn't an enjoyable ride for me. Uh, I'm glad I saw it. Do I want to see this movie again? Not really. It's not a movie that I, I think I enjoyed as much as I kind of had hoped I would have. Um, and what really, again, took me out of the movie was Nick Nolte's acting. Um, not a fan of him, especially in this movie. I liked him in 48 Hours, did not like him in this movie. So for that reason, I originally thought it was a movie that I could kind of, you know, go 50-50 on and give a 2.5. You know, I could go either way with the movie. But the more I think about it, I'm actually leaning more towards the negative. So for that reason, I'm giving it a 2.0. All right, I'll go next. So, Cape Fear. This movie, I thought, was going to be a richer experience than what I had previously recalled in the back of my head. And in general, I think that I was even more disappointed than I was than the first time I had seen it. The hope was going to be that this is going to be a a more... uh, I was thinking that Martin Scorsese was going to carry me through a lot more than he did the uh the the extreme close-ups and uh the the lighting of things and how he set things up i just didn't go for it at all it it was it was disappointing and the only thing that really went well in my watch of this is max katie his character is truly intimidating and and very very scary he is not 
your typical person. He is relentless in this movie, and you feel like that you're never going to escape him. And so when he finally dies at the end, it's like, oh, finally. But, you know, the rest of the characters, eh, you know, I, I suppose that, you know, Juliette Lewis is worthy of that Oscar nomination. For the most part, she is an angsty teen. I get that. And that scene between her and Max, you know, the two of them in the theater, wow. That was just like 10 levels of creepiness that I never want to experience again. But kudos to Robert De Niro for pulling that off. I think part of the reason why he comes across so awkwardly is because of that nasty haircut that he has. He just, he just, I don't know, he just looks off. And so because of that, well, it, it, it works for the character. Uh, like I said, Joe Don Baker. I, I enjoyed Kasich or Kersek in this, but not enough. Uh, sorry, it, it, it just... I, oh, and drag uh, another hour to go. No, I just had a really hard time with it. So for me, yeah, okay, I saw it, and I, I guess you can't hit it out of the park every time. But you know, in this, I, I feel like that as a whole experience, this movie is kind of a clunker, and so I'm going to give it one fuck, one fuck from the professor and two point oh. From the comic book guy, John. When we put directors into the hat and we started pulling them out and we pulled out Martin Scorsese, I I found myself with an interesting question to myself. What Martin Scorsese film do I feel is my favorite? That's where I started with. And I would say it was Goodfellas. Never did I once think that, you know, Cape Fear would be uh, even in the realm of possibility of me putting in as a Martin Scorsese film. Uh, Cause you have the departed, you have the aviator, you have gangs in New York on and on and on. Right. Um, Casino, which was on the other night, which I fucking watched anyways. Um, I wanted to put something in that was different than all of the ones that I had just mentioned because all of the ones that I have just mentioned uh, have a, a similar tone or uh, they're all kind of in the same vein of each other. They're all a Martin Scorsese film. This one was a remake, so it wasn't originally his idea. And I was curious to see, you know, what he would do with someone else's uh, film, uh, with a film that came before it. I got to say, um, I wasn't really impressed. Uh, I think the name recognition alone, like kind of like we talked about, you know, is right after Goodfellas. He's got good press going in. He's got Robert De Niro. He's got Nick Nolte. He's got Jessica Lange. You know, it, it was a, it was a, a hit. The only thing that uh, was missing was, well, the hit. So, um, looking back on it now, I remember not liking it all that much when I first saw it. And I think like you professor, I liked it even less when I watched it last night. And I think my biggest issue is Nick Nolte and the length of the film, right? I think that there's a lot of moments in this film that work and there's a lot of moments in this film that don't work. And I think that the, the parts that don't work for me outweigh the parts that do work. And and unfortunately for what works isn't enough to make me, really even want to watch this again so because of all of that i am going to give cape fear 2.5 fucks and i'm giving it 2.5 fucks solely for robert de niro's performance Juliet lewis's performance and the fact that you know it was scorsese his name carries weight with me and i'll watch it might not mean i'll always like it but i'll at least give it a chance Uh, I gave it a chance. I didn't like it, but you still get a halfway decent mark from me. 2.5 fucks. All right. Now comes the time of our podcast where we are going to select our next film. Uh, We are going to go back to the Bronco helmet. And because I'm feeling generous, I am not going to let John pick this film. And I'm going to let the professor get in there and dig around. Okay, here comes. Reaching deep. You guys are so childish. I'm not going to take that one. I'm going to take. Use, use your thumb a little. Use your thumb. Okay. Get it around there. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. could you imagine if we got that? Wouldn't that be fun? Guys like you don't die on toilets. All right. So the professor is going to pick our next film and... Our next film was put in by... It's 
right on the crease. <laughs> I did that on purpose. You're a dick. <laughs> Asshole. The movie is... The Outsiders. Pony Boy. Dallas. Johnny. Cherry. Soda Pop. Daryl. Two Bit. Essie Hetton's classic novel comes to the screen. Capturing all the intensity, all the excitement, all the emotions of youth. The Outsiders, directed by Francis Coppola. All right, so our next movie is going to be Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders, submitted to us by probably one of our biggest fans, my daughter Elise. So there you have it. Does she listen to all of our shows? I don't think she has listened to a one. (laughs) Yet she gets a movie. And she's a big fan? Oh, she loves The Outsiders. All right, so that is going to wrap it up for this episode of Three Guys in a Flick. Uh, Hey, John, where can they find us? As always, they can find us at our website, threeguysinaflick.com. If you do check it out, be sure to check out our articles on each movie we post. We tend to put our show notes on there as well as some trivia and links uh, to other information. Uh, So please be sure to check it out. Uh, You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can find us at any podcasting hosting site. We're on iTunes, Podbeam, Spotify. You can find us at any of those. If you do check us out on those, please go ahead and subscribe or even leave us some comments about, you know, any shows that you listen to. We'd love to read your comments. All right. We just want to say a special thanks to Zach, Ronnie, and Jill and everyone who listens to us out there. Uh, For Three Guys in a Flick, I'm Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. Thanks for listening. Okay, uh, I'm going to need you to shut the fuck up for a second. Okay, thanks. Could you think you could do that? Why don't you mute me? Uh, I'm going to need you to define special. Slow. Mm. See? Did you not get... That's wrong. Did you not get that impression at all? No! (laughs) Okay, I'm glad we're not recording. He lures her to... He lures her to... He lures... Don't look at me. Don't look me in the fucking eyes, dude. I look at both of you fuckers. It's the negative. So for that reason, I'm giving it a 2.0. 2.0 2. from the comic book Fuck. guy. Wow. Uh, that's probably... That's <laughs> One of these days. See how fast I was on that? <laughs> you were you were right there. And you were waiting for it. And John was... oh, Because I saw it coming a mile away. <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about. Fuck off and listen to uh, earlier podcasts. Stay gold, pony boy. Stay gold. All right, fuck off. Good night.